Now, please welcome our next speaker, Eric Beard. Eric is a senior specialist solutions architect at Amazon Web Services, and he's leading the technical field community for infrastructure as code. Eric was formerly the manager for the AWS Cloud Development Kit team and frequently consulted with customers on adopting infrastructure as code and modern DevOps practices. Prior to Amazon, he was the chief technology officer at Autoloop, now Affinitiv, a leading automotive software company. Eric's technology career spans two decades, preceding, preceded by service in the US Moving Corps. In his spare time, he loves to play tennis and backpack. Eric will talk about best practices for developing and deploying cloud infrastructure with AWS Cloud Development Kit, CDK. You will learn about the design philosophy of CDK, how it's being used at Amazon, and the best way to design your cloud applications to take advantage of everything CDK has to offer. Once again, remember to ask your questions in the chat so we can address them during the panel discussion. Eric, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am, uh, I'm very happy to be here today to, uh, to talk to you about uh, to talk to you about CDK. Um, hopefully everybody can uh, see my, my slides. There we go. <clears throat> um, so uh, that was a good introduction. So as he said, my name's Eric Beard. Uh, I'm a specialist SA with, uh, with Amazon. I've been working with uh, AWS CDK for many years now. I was the manager, for the software development manager for that team in 2021 when we delivered CDK v2, we delivered uh, Go language support for CDK, we delivered uh, CDK pipelines, um, and I still um, am working very closely with the uh, with the service team for both CDK and uh, and CloudFormation. So today in this talk, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Cloud Development Kit, and I, I assume that most of you have probably heard of it. It's it's starting to get very popular, but I will do a basic introduction uh, for CDK for those of you who are, are not uh, familiar with it. Um, you know, AWS CDK uh, is an open source framework that allows you to specify your infrastructure as code in a higher level language. Uh, and, you know, normally, like if you're using something like CloudFormation, you're going to be using JSON or YAML. But with CDK, you get to use your favorite language, just so your favorite language is one of Python, JavaScript, uh, TypeScript, Java, C Sharp, uh, or Go. And as you can see from the screenshot we have here, uh, you can accomplish a lot with CDK in, in a very small number of lines of code, right? In this example, we're creating <clears throat> a, a VPC. We're creating an ECS cluster, Elastic Container Services, an ECS cluster and a network load balance Fargate service. So we're creating an entire microservice and all of the resources uh, that are needed to maintain it in about a dozen lines of code here. And CDK gives you the ability to use IDEs. So then you get all of those benefits of an IDE. You get IntelliSense, you get uh, completion, you get you know documentation can pop up right there in the IDE. And then you get to use uh, all of the regular abstractions you're used to using with your programming language. You can do loops, you can write classes, you can have subclasses. You can do just anything you want to do with a, a regular programming language in order to build higher and higher levels of uh, abstractions for your infrastructure as code. So the development workflow with CDK, so there is a CDK has a CLI. Um, and when, when you start out using a CDK project, you'll start by doing a CDK init. And this just sort of creates some boilerplate code to get you started with a new project, you can choose what kind of project you're building, whether it's a construct library, an application, you can choose what language you're going to use. Uh, and then at that point, you know, you go and you'll, you'll, you'll write your code for whatever infrastructure that you're going to create. And then you'll do a build step. So in the example here, we're doing an NPM run build. Now this depends on the language that you chose, you know, with, with Java or C sharp, you're going to do a compilation step. You know, if you're using Python or JavaScript, obviously there's no compilation, but there's usually still some sort of build step you're going to be running. Uh, a linter, uh, maybe a, a you know maybe you're running black for Python, you know whatever other things you you need to do to, uh, any unit tests that you have, uh, and then the next step is you're going to do a CDK synth. So this is synthesizing what we call a cloud assembly. So with CDK, I think some people tend to 
put CDK into the bucket of being just a code generator, right? So, so you're going to use CDK. CDK is built on top of AWS CloudFormation, and it's going to generate a CloudFormation template in, in JSON for you. But CDK goes a lot further than that. So a synthesized cloud assembly is not only the A template or a collection of templates, so it may be multiple stacks, but it's also the assets. And this is where CDK is, is very strong and it does a lot more than a typical code generator is CDK is also going to handle your deployments for you. So with the CDK deploy command you see here, this is going to package up your assets, go and stage them for you in S3, uh, whether that be you know Lambda functions or, or containers. Uh, and then it's just going to handle uh, deploying that correctly and, and linking that up with the CloudFormation template so you don't have to do that yourself. Anyone here who has you know, used uh, CloudFormation itself to, you know, maybe do a serverless application with Lambda, you know, you have to, you know, zip up your, your Lambda function, you have to go stage it in S3 somewhere, there's a lot of manual steps. So CDK takes those manual steps out for you. Uh, the other step that I skipped here is a CDK diff. So what this allows you to do is after you've compiled and synthesized your application, you can do a diff between what you have compiled and what you have already deployed so that you can see the changes that are going to be made. And it's always good to, to review this and take some time to make sure that all of the changes were intentional. Uh, you, know, you want to make sure that you didn't accidentally, you know, rename uh, the logical ID for a database and now your database is getting dropped and, and rebuilt, right? So you always want to do a CDK diff uh, to, to make sure you're, you're, you're getting what you expect. So uh, at this point, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the CDK philosophy, basically, you know, how, why we designed CDK the way that we did, right? Um, because CDK is something that we built not just for customers to use, but we use it internally. I think this is, uh, I think an important question some people ask, you know, they say, okay, this is CDK, it's this open source project, is, is it going to be supported for a long time? Is this, you know, a serious thing? And, I, and it is. Uh, it's being used by a lot of customers, and it's also fully adopted by Amazon service teams for building out new new applications. Uh, it's basically the default choice for both Amazon retail and AWS for our service teams to build out new microservices. Uh, and, and I think that should tell you that this is something that's going to be supported, well supported by AWS for a long time. So when we were designing it, you know, we were looking at, okay, you know, what, what are some of the common causes we have of production outages and deployment failures? And what we found is that many times, it was the re result of some sort of out of band change to our application, right? So, you know, in, in sort of a traditional organization at a company, you know, you may have, uh, as, as we see on this slide, you may have, you know, an infrastructure team and, and back before we were in the cloud, you know, this is the team that was actually, you know, taking servers to the data center, sliding them in the racks, you know, setting up the networking, installing the operating systems. And, and that's evolved now to where infrastructure teams maybe are now the ones who are responsible for provisioning infrastructure in the cloud and managing it there. And then, you know, we have maybe a separate team that's our development team. And these are our developers. They're, they're using source control. They're using disciplined processes. They're doing code reviews. They're doing unit tests. And, you know, we found that usually when we had a, a, something bad happen in production, you know, we had a, had a service outage, it wasn't usually the code itself. It wasn't usually a bug that was in the code that was causing the problem, right? It was some other change that got made, right? So maybe we have, you know, a third department that's our operations department who's doing configuration and deployment. And, you know, somebody had to log in and, you know, manually change an environment setting file somewhere, or they had to manually change a network setting. And that's what would cause the outage, right? So with CDK, what we're trying to do is take all of those organizations and all of those, the sort of siloed pieces of your application and make them one thing, right? So even if, you know, you've, you've, you've migrated to more of a modern application development philosophy and you have you know small autonomous dev teams who kind of own their their entire application you'll still find those divisions in code you know you'll have your your infrastructure project over here and you'll have your runtime project over here and then you might have a separate way of doing uh, you know, configuration and deployment so with cdk we want all of that to become one thing so we're going to put all of our infrastructure in a single application that same application is going to have all of our runtime code uh, and it's also going to have our delivery pipeline is going to be specified in that application. Uh, and then all of our configuration <clears throat> for our target environments is also going to be in there. So with CDK, we're sort of changing what has always been considered sort of a best practice in the industry with software development, which is 
we're going to create a single immutable deployment artifact. And then we're going to drop that artifact as is into different environments and then configure it for those environments. So it's, it's an immutable, single immutable artifact. We're gonna put it in a sandbox environment, dev, test, staging, prod, whatever those environments are called. And then we're going to configure it separately. With CDK, that's not what we're doing. So with CDK, we're going to generate a distinct template and a set of assets and configuration for each of those environments ahead of time, right? So it's, it's like I said, it's one app and you know all of your configuration for your beta environment, all of your configuration for your production environment goes right in your source code. Obviously you're not going to put secrets in there. You use AWS Secrets Manager for, for things like that, but all of it goes right into the source code. So after you have you know bootstrapped a series of accounts, with you know, basic guardrails uh, and things like that. After that point, nothing in any of those uh, AWS accounts will change that doesn't go through a Git push and go through this, um, this uh, one CDK application. So obviously this, is, this talk is focused on best practices. Um, what I'm gonna start with now is, is to talk a little bit about the organization, right? I, I know everyone's here, you wanna hear about, hear about code, you wanna hear about CDK specifically, but I think it's very important um, to, to consider the way your teams are organized and the way your applications are organized before you get down into the details of, of the implementation, right? So the first thing I always like to recommend is, is that, you know, a company of any, any size should have, you know, a, you should have a team. Uh, we generally call it a cloud center of excellence. This might just be, you know, at a smaller company, maybe it's one person, but at a larger company, maybe it's an entire team, five, six, seven people, who's really responsible for that sort of account bootstrapping, responsible for best practices, uh, setting up a landing zone for your teams to use. So you'll have like this primary account where all of your AWS organization's controls are. Uh, you don't know, have separate accounts for log archiving and auditing. Uh, but then the important part here is these provisioned accounts down in the lower right. And what you wanna build is, you know, what I call an account vending machine. So this is a way for individual developers and development teams to just go and create AWS accounts at will. And then this landing zone will make sure that those accounts are provisioned with all of your company's, you know, best practice guardrails, your preventative controls, your detective controls uh, in place already. But after that point, the dev team owns those accounts. They're admins in those accounts and they can basically do what they want with them. And, and you know that since you've set up these guardrails that, that you have a certain level of safety and you're going to get alerts if the developers, you know, kind of step outside of any of those, any of those guardrails. So next I'll talk about, uh, you know, about another best practice here for CDK and for in really any modern cloud application is you really want to be deploying your application to multiple accounts. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of customers, you know, helping them, you know, troubleshoot issues that they're having with their AWS deployments. And oftentimes the problems that they're having are stemming from putting too many applications in one account or putting too many developers in one account. And it's very difficult to segregate them. There's a very large, blast radius for any changes or errors that get made. You know, one person can accidentally take down, you know, uh, you know, other developers applications, or maybe even take down production because you've gone over a service service limit. So I really like to encourage customers to use many, many accounts and allow your developers to have their own dedicated sandbox accounts. Um, we, we do get pushback sometimes from customers who say, well, that's, that's going to be really expensive, but actually in the long run, you know, your, your developers, are really one of your biggest expenses. And, and if they're all slowed down and they have lots of bottlenecks because they're all forced to work out of a single account, uh, that's costing you money, right? So here on the screen, I have, you know, what I would consider sort of the, the canonical setup for a new microservice. You know, we have a, 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 you know, a team at AWS is going to go make a new application. They have a new microservice. So we're gonna set up a dedicated CI CD account for doing delivery. We're gonna have a dedicated beta account, a gamma account, a prod, we tend to use beta and gamma. I know you, you might use dev, test, stage, QA. It doesn't really matter what you call them. But the idea is that these are separate accounts um, and uh, and the developers all have their own sandbox accounts. So, you know, I do all my development. I'm just kind of treating my AWS account like an extension of my workstation. And, you know, I'm doing my development and, and you know, then I, I submit some code for code review. And as soon as that Git push happens, and like I said, with CDK, that's how all changes are happening to our account. There's just nothing in those accounts that's ever going to change that doesn't go through this app. And we're going to do a code review. We're going to have unit tests. Uh, as soon as that passes code review, and that's when our automation starts, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize developer productivity 
And as I'm developing my CDK application, I'm develop, deploying it into my own sandbox account. And we want to keep that fast. I want to be able to do really quick development and test cycles. Uh, one of the really cool new features that we've added to CDK is called CDK Hot Swap. Um, so, you know, if, if you're using a, a large, complex, you know, CloudFormation application, uh, you make a change and you want to deploy that into your account, uh, you might have to wait a few minutes for that deployment to finish. Uh, with CDK Hot Swap, if, you, if you're working with something like a Lambda function, we can detect that only that asset has changed and we'll just do a really quick uh, swap of that, that function without doing the entire CDK deployment process, which can make the, the dev test cycle for a developer fast enough that you don't really need to build mocks. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, you know, mocking services out there that will attempt to mock AWS services for local unit testing. But if you can make that dev test cycle really fast, which you can with CDK Hot Swap, you get full fidelity. You can just actually use, you know, DynamoDB and Lambda and all of that in your sandbox account. It makes things much faster. Uh, and so then we go through code review and then code review is the last human gate before uh, deployment, right? So uh, at, at AWS, we do trunk-based deployment. We don't do branches and we don't use Gitflow. We do trunk-based deployment. And after that code review, on our deployment process starts. And if all of the tests that, all of the automated tests that happen uh, in, in all of these different environments, if they all succeed, that change is, is going out to production. So every single change that a developer checks in and goes past code review will automatically go all the way to production without any further human gates. It's all automated. And that's another best practice for when you're, when you're writing your CDK applications uh, is, to, is to fully automate your deployments. So you're going to want to use uh, something called CD, something like CDK pipelines uh, to set up your CI CD pipelines so that you, know, you deploy into maybe an alpha or a beta account. Uh, you do your initial round of automated testing and then it proceeds to the next account and, and you know your tests start to get more and more realistic you know when you get to your gamma account this is an account that's totally locked down it's just like production developers are not allowed to log into that account uh, you're going to run some some realistic load testing against that account and then if all those automated tests succeed that's when you move on to to production and even in production you may do waves right like you may just deploy out to one region first and see how that works and then deploy to a second region and then roll out to the to the rest of the regions and uh, you know CDK pipelines and AWS code pipeline uh, all allow you to to set up this kind of uh, this kind of deployment. So now best practices part two, we'll get to actually some uh, some specific uh, you know CDK best practices. So the first thing, place I want to start is to talk about CDK construct libraries. So the fundamental uh, unit of, of code sharing in CDK is called a construct. Uh, and any of you who have used CDK knows there's something called AWS CDK lib. This is the construct library. Um, so we, we have a library that allows you to, uh, you know, create a Lambda function or create an S3 bucket or, or an RDS database in, in just a few lines of code uh, with a lot of, you know, same defaults kind of built into the constructors so that you don't have to specify every little thing uh, yourself. Of, of course, you can override those things, but those constructs are really what you want to share. So if you're writing CDK internally and you want to, to, to share that code with other teams, you don't want to share CDK apps. You don't want to share CDK stacks. You want to share constructs. And you want to put those into some sort of internal artifact repository like uh, AWS Code Artifact or JFrag, JFrog Artifactory or GitHub Packages, something so that your application teams can use those. And then you want to sort of make an internal open source type of repository, something that's not visible to the public, but it's visible to internal developers so they can contribute changes back to those constructs as they find things that they, that they want to improve. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about CDK construct levels. Uh, I think this is important because if you get into CDK development, you're going to start hearing these terms. You're going to start hearing L1, L2, L3, and you might be wondering, like, what are those? What does that mean? So L1 is a layer one construct, and this is auto-generated based on the CloudFormation specification. So there is, you can, you can go to the AWS documentation and you can find there's a, there's a big JSON file you can download that has the entire CloudFormation spec. And that's uh, actually currently being replaced by a new resource schema. So every resource in CloudFormation, let's say you have you know, AWS colon colon S3 colon colon bucket. It has a resource schema and a JSON file that you can go and download and it will tell you all of the properties uh, that belong to that bucket and which ones are required, which ones are write-only, which ones are read-only. So it's a very detailed specification for CloudFormation. 
So CDK takes that and auto generates an entire series of constructs based on that. So CDK automatically covers the entire surface area of CloudFormation. So if, so if there is a resource that's supported in CloudFormation, it's supported by CDK. Within about a week or so, CDK does releases at roughly, you know, one, roughly once a week. Uh, the thing about these constructs is that they're very verbose, right? So it's, you know, if you had to write 20 lines of code in YAML to do it in CloudFormation, you're going to have to write 20 lines of TypeScript to do it in CDK with an L1. Right. So it's useful. It's getting you into a higher level language. And some customers just like to use L1s and then build all their own abstractions on top of that. But I think that the, the real popularity of CDK comes from the next level. And this is layer two. So the layer two constructs are handcrafted. Uh, we have a, a core service team at AWS that manages this construct library. And then we also work with the open source community. I think that AWS CDK is probably one of the best examples of a successful open source project at AWS. Uh, we generally have four, 400 to 500 unique contributors every year from outside of the company that are, that are helping to build uh, CDK. And then we have this core team that's sort of, you know, they're the ones who are merging PRs and making sure that, you know, that the design is right and, and, and doing all the code reviews on all of that. But this L2 library, like I said, it's handcrafted. And it's, it's made with, you know, let's think about the most common use cases. You know, let's say a customer wants to create a Lambda function. What's the most common way that they're normally going to do that? And let's just set up those defaults so that you can call the constructor and create that function in, in just a, a line or two of code and get the basics started. You know, same for an S3 bucket. You can create an S3 bucket in, in one line of code. Uh, so that's the L2 layer. And they're, so they're slightly opinionated but they're flexible. You, you can still override pretty much everything about an L2, even, even though, like I said, it, it, it gives you some same defaults and it's, and it's configuring some things the way that we think most people are going to want to configure them. You can override everything. And then we have something called escape patches that lets you get, go down to the L1 level to override pretty much anything you want. So it's maximum flexibility. And then the next level up is what we call an L3. And this is, this is something that we don't tend to write a whole lot of L3s. This is what we want you to write. So an L3 is when you're taking a collection of L2s, three or four different services, and combining them together in a highly opinionated way to do something very specific for a use case that you have. And then that might be something you can share internally at your company with other development teams who need to do kind of the same thing, right? Um, so, so this is where some of the real value of abstraction and being able to use high-level programming languages come in is with these L3s. So I'll go a little bit more into detail on, on the construct levels. And, and I want to talk about a pattern that is, is sort of starting to be called L2.5, right? So it's, it's a little bit in between L2s and L3s. So what many companies will do is, is you know, they start with our L2 construct library, Lambda function, S3 bucket, uh, you, know, RDS or, you know, RDS database, Dynamo table. And they go, okay, those, those, those defaults are nice, but they don't really cover all of our company's best practices. Or maybe we have some security guidelines that we want to make it easy for, for our, our developers uh, to, to follow. So what we're going to do is we're going to subclass every one of those L2s. And they'll build out, you know, their version of the Dynamo table and EC2 instance, Lambda function. So they're subclasses. So you're getting all the benefits of the work we've already done, but then you override things. You know, you, you, you might, you know, maybe your requirement is that, you know, all of your S3 buckets are always encrypted. They always have logging enabled. Uh, they have versioning enabled. So you could just do that uh, by default. So when a developer uses your L2.5 construct uh, to instantiate an S3 bucket, they get all of those settings uh, by default. Um, you know, one of the things you want to keep in mind with, with this, one of the potential drawbacks here is that there is a growing collection of high-level L3 patterns out on the internet. We have something called a construct hub uh, at a website called uh, constructs.dev. Um, so, so there's a, a growing pat a collection of these high-level patterns uh, that if you mandate that your developers use your internal L2.5 construct library, you're kind of cutting them off from all of those those public L3 patterns, right? Because those L3s are probably not going to be using those, obviously, and and they're they're going to be a little bit less configurable. So it's sort of a trade-off that you're making if you uh, if you follow these patterns. All right, so let's um, let's get into some do's and don'ts for developing construct libraries. So as you're developing a construct library internally. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to write and publish these using something called JSII. 
So JSAI is another technology that the AWS CDK team manages, and it's what we use to vend the CDK in multiple languages. The CDK is written in TypeScript, and but then you're, a lot, you're able to use it from Python or from Go, and the way we do that is from JSAI. So JSAI handles uh, recreating all of the type signatures for all of the construct libraries in each of those languages. Uh, and then there's um, um, an RPC mechanism so that uh, the code, it's written in TypeScript, so that code is going to be running in Node. So no matter what language you choose, whether you choose Java or Go or C Sharp, you still have a Node process running when you do CDK synthesis locally, right? Uh, and JSAI is, is handling all of that interop. So we encourage you to do the same thing with your own construct libraries. Write them in TypeScript, and then you can vend them out to your development teams, and they can use them in whatever language they, they prefer, right? That's one of the really big benefits of going with a microservices architecture is that every team can choose the right tool for the job for every microservice they create. So if, if they're building one and Python is a better choice, they can use Python. If they're building another microservice uh, and they want to use you know, Go, they can use Go. And, and if you write these in TypeScript and use JSAI, all of these teams will be able to take advantage of these construct libraries that you write. The next one, like I said, is vending constructs. You, what you don't want to share is stacks, right? So a stack, we see a stack as more of like a deployment detail. You know, when you're writing a CDK application, when you look at your app, that very top level file that, that, that creates the CDK app, that should be pretty lean. And then when you're instantiating stacks, those should also be pretty lean. Most of your code should go into constructs. You should sort of get used to starting with a construct and then using stacks and apps as more of the deployment details for those constructs. Uh, the next one is you want to make sure that you're doing the configuration for these constructs uh, with with the with properties, right? So every CDK class basically has three arguments to the constructor, right? You have uh, the scope, and then you have a logical name, and then the third one is a property bag that you want to use to fully configure your construct. So what we see as an anti-pattern is that if you have stacks or constructs in your reading environment variables, or really looking doing any external like a file lookup or a network lookup for, for your environment. And I know that's a habit that was hard for me to break when I first started CDK. It took me a while to get used to that because I'm used to just, you know, you write, you write an application and you just litter it with environment variable lookups, right? Like that's, that's how you figure out what environment you're in and what, what, how the settings are different. Um, so the, the one exception here is I think the, the one place in a CDK application that's okay to have environment variable lookups is in that very top level app file. So if you're doing Python, it would be, you know, app.py and only for developer sandbox environments. If you're using CDK pipelines, you'll actually put the full configuration for each of your target deployment environments in the code, right? Beta, gamma, prod, that's in the code. But for developers, you never know how many developers you're going to have on your team. So you don't want to hard code all of their individual machine settings into your application. So that's the one place where I think it's kind of okay to read environment variables, and that's just for sandbox environments. Anywhere else, you should treat that as an anti-pattern if you're doing environment variable lookups, either in stacks or in constructs. Uh, the next one is unit testing your infrastructure. Uh, one of the cool things about CDK and you know the way CDK pipelines works is you if, if you write what we call a deterministic CDK application, no matter where you do that synthesis, whether it's on a developer's laptop or if it's on your CI CD server, you should get exactly the same template and assets uh, created, right? Um, and that enables you to do unit testing. So you can locally on your workstation unit test the production deployment to make sure it's right, to make sure it has the right size database, to make sure you haven't dropped any you know, critical resources, right? So that's a really great thing about CDK that it enables you to do. Uh, the, the next best practice, uh, has to do with using constructs for, um, you know, for convenience versus using constructs for compliance. Um, like I mentioned, you can write that L2.5 layer to, to encapsulate all of your company's best practices. Uh, and, and that will help developers be compliant, right? But it's a convenience uh, factor. So uh, the developers are in total control, right? They can override things. They can suppress things. So I would recommend, you know, if you have strict... Uh, compliance concerns and you have auditors that you want to use a separate feature like CloudFormation hooks uh, to go in and, and install these checks so that, you know, kind of outside of the developer's control so that, you know, right before you actually deploy a CloudFormation stack, you make some checks and you make sure that you're not breaking any of your company's rules. But then you go and you build that convenience into your into your construct library. Okay. 
So moving on to best practices for application development, right? Um, so here are some do's and don'ts for writing CDK applications. Um, we generally recommend that you allow CDK and CloudFormation to generate your uh, physical names for your resources. Like it's, it's possible with CDK, possible with CloudFormation to give all of your resources hard-coded names, but we generally recommend to just let CDK do that. So you'll put a logical name into your code and then the actual name of that resource is going to, it'll have part of the logical name in it, but it'll have some random characters on the end. Uh, this generally uh, gives you the maximum amount of flexibility. It means that you can deploy apps multiple times, you know, into a single environment. You know, you'll be generating, uh, you know, different names for those. Um, I, I will say, and, and there are some use cases where this is actually, you know, can can prevent uh, outages in production, right? But one of the one of those cases is with an IAM role. Uh, you know, if you've given an IAM role a hard coded name and then you need to make a change to it, generally what CloudFormation is going to do is it's going to drop it and then recreate it. And now you've got a few seconds where that role doesn't exist, and things that rely on that role are going to break. Um, so if you're letting CDK and CloudFormation generate that name, uh, that that transition can be can be made a lot smoother. Uh, I will say. Uh, this is probably one of the best practices that that I break <laughs> more often than any other ones. I think times when actually giving things hard coded physical names can be a benefit is if you are in one of those environments where you have a lot of developers in one account or you have a lot of different applications, maybe your your QA environment and your prod environment are in the same account. Like I said, it's a best practice not to do that, but I find that many, many, many customers are just in that situation and it's difficult for them to get out of it for, for various reasons. Uh, and in that case, uh, that can be one of those times where it does kind of help to, let's say, have a standard naming pattern to where every time you name one of your resources, you put uh, the environment name, the account, I, uh, not the account number, the region, uh, and, and, you know, maybe a unique identifier so that no matter who's deploying it or what app deployed it, it's really easy to tell what app it belongs to without having to, like, go and look at tags or something. So, like I said, it's the best practice. Generally, it, it, this is a good place to start. There can be some reasons to, to break this rule. Uh, the next one is making choices about uh, how do I separate my stacks? I get a lot of questions from customers and say, you know, how many constructs should I have? How many stacks should I have within a, a single application? And, you know, that's a hard question to answer, you know, definitely for every application. You know, generally just start with, you know, one CDK app, uh, one stack, one construct. Like I said, try to put most of your code in a construct. Um, and if it's a fairly simple application that just deploys a few resources, that's probably good enough, right? But let's say you're developing something like, uh, you know, you have a, a static website with a REST API and a database all in one CDK application. Um, it might be good to separate those stacks into a stateful stack and a stateless stack. You want to really think about how am I going to be deploying this application and, and what changes and, and what should go into uh, a stack that's going to have frequent changes, right? So if you're if you're developing Lambda functions, you're probably going to be changing those all the time. You're going to be making little business logic adjustments to those Lambda functions, but your stack that deploys your database, you're probably never going to change that one, right? So make a stateful stack, put termination protection on that stack so you can't accidentally delete it, and then put your stateless resources into a different stack. And then maybe maybe you want to do some monitoring, set up some CloudWatch logs. Those could go into a third third stack. I, I think two to three stacks per application is probably the average and is probably a decent place to start, just really depending on the complexity of the microservice. The next one is to make your app deterministic. And I mentioned this before in relation to unit testing. So any of you who have done CDK development have may have noticed that there's this file that gets generated called cdk.context.json. And what a lot of folks will do is they'll get ignore that and they won't check that in to source control, but we want you to check that in. So this file has the result of, of lookups. So as I mentioned, we, we kind of see it as an anti-pattern to be looking at environment variables or be doing network lookups inside your constructs to go and look at configuration information somewhere. Uh, and one of the best examples for this is a VPC, right? Every uh, every region kind of has a different um, different VPC layout, right? There might be five AZs, there might be three AZs. So so there's the the VPCs have 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 a different configuration, um, and in CDK, you can do something called a vpc.fromlookup. And so what happens with that one is CDK will look and see, do I have that file cached locally in cdk.context.json? If I don't, I'm going to go make a network lookup to get that information, but I'm only going to do it once. And so you do that once, 
that information gets stored, you check it into source control, and then it never happens again. And that makes your app deterministic. That makes it so that every time you do a synth, no matter what environment you're in, you're going to get the same synthesized template. And this will help you with, uh, with your unit testing. The next one, uh, the next best practice is that we really want you to allow CDK to create roles. Uh, this is where your central security teams uh, might come in and sort of have a little bit of an issue with this. You, know, you may have some sort of ticketing system where if, where if you need a role created, you have to put in a ticket and wait for the security team to create it. And then you get the ARN and then you can plug that into your application. That kind of thing is going to make writing CDK apps really difficult because I think one of the biggest benefits of the L2 lib the class library is that it creates those roles for you. You know, let's say that you link uh, a Lambda function in a Dynamo table. You know, you've got a function that needs to be able to, to read and write data in a Dynamo table. The L2 will just handle creating that role for you. So you don't have to go and write, you know, 20 lines of code to, and, and, you know, make typos and spend time troubleshooting that role. We're just going to write it. Uh, so you really want to, to allow CDK to manage those roles. Uh, and, you know, that if, if you're talking to your security team about this, I think the direction you want to go is, hey, let's work on setting up some good guardrails, some good preventative and detective controls in the accounts so that we're free to create roles. And if we do anything that falls outside of the company's best practices, you know, we'll get an alert. The next one is to you know model all of your production stages. Uh, and what this means is what I was talking about earlier about how all of the configuration for your target deployments, whether that be gamma, beta, production, goes right into the code, right? So you don't want to actually have you know something where you're just creating one uh, cloud assembly, one template, and then you're you know dropping in an environment file at deployment time, right? You want to actually model all of that right there in your code. And you know the next slide I'll talk about what you're going to use uh, when you're when you're doing these uh, you know cross region cross account deployments is CDK pipelines. You know if you're using CDK and you haven't evaluated this, I highly encourage you to go and, and check this out and and sort of demo it a little bit and try it out because this can take so much time off of developing your pipelines. Anyone who has ever had to manually create a cross region or cross account pipeline, maybe you do it manually in the console or you've done it with CloudFormation. You know, that is a lot of work and there's a lot of things you can get wrong. Security is really tricky. Uh, so CDK pipelines just turns that into just a very manageable number of lines of code, uh, makes it very easy to uh, reason about. One of the really cool things about it is these pipelines are self mutating so that if you add, say, a new stage into your pipeline, you don't have to go and manually redeploy the pipeline. The pipeline will fix itself uh, based on the new configuration in the CDK app. So CDK pipelines is a, is a, is a really, really great feature. And then uh, the last best practice that I'd like to cover is a contribution, right? AWS CDK is open source. So if you are enthusiastic about CDK, if you're using CDK, please get involved in the community. Um, you know, the, we, we have a lot of activity going on here. You know, there's a lot of people submitting pull requests and, and, and issues, you know, bug reports. And if you're active in the community and you, and you start to get connected with the, the core CDK maintainer team, uh, it's a lot easier to, you know, to make changes happen and to and to get things done to kind of move move along the feature requests that you have. You know, maybe you could even start start contributing, um, and that just gives you a much much deeper understanding of of the way that uh, of the way that CDK works. So I think that's just about all the time I have. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for your attention, and uh, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have uh, later on. Thank you, Eric, for your excellent talk on CDK best practices. Your experience and expertise in the field is truly valuable. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today.